have someone here today that um, has embouchure dystonia as well. So it's very nice to talk to someone who can relate on so many levels. And especially since we kind of have a, a something in common also besides dystonia, uh, we have both at least at some point lived in Iowa. So I'm going to post this for him now. I know he can maybe see that the Iowa Hawkeyes logo. <laughs> Go Hawkeyes. <laughs> and I'm going to add him in now. This is Adam Stevens. And we're going to go. All right. There we are. All right. Welcome, Adam. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you for having me. And I'm right. You 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 got at least two of your degree, two of your three degrees uh, from Iowa, University of Iowa, right? Yes, that is correct. I did my master's and my doctorate at University of Iowa. Oh, that's awesome. And just to let you guys know out there who are, are watching or, or chime in later that um, I went to University of Northern Iowa, so we're kind of, you know, like, you know, don't don't talk to each other. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, a rare, a rare exception. <laughs> well, Adam, thank you for being here today and talking with me about your dystonia. Um, let's go ahead and just start off with you kind of introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about your music background, like what got you into tuba playing, um, how long you've been playing, and just kind of that general timeline. Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I started I started playing tuba at the age of nine. Um, I did not want to play tuba. My brother was a trumpet player, um, and I either wanted to play drums or I wanted to play trumpet. Um, but whenever we went to the instrument, like fitting session, um, it, it was pretty much thrust upon me. It was like, you're, you're a big kid. You're playing the tuba. Uh, so <laughs> that's, that's what I did. Um, I got, got the tuba, uh, and just started going with it. And, uh, the band director at the time was a euphonium player. So she was able to, uh, give me private lessons in addition to the, uh, lessons that I, I had through through the school. Um, so I, I, I had an advantage there and I was also the only tuba player. So I got put in the band uh, really early because I know a lot of kids, they had to they had to go through like, you know, the first 30 of the the, the old best in class book. But I, I got right in there and then um, I just ended up falling in love with the instrument uh, from from the get go. Um, I never really looked back and said, oh, man, I wish I had gotten to play trumpet or anything like that. So I, I never had any regrets like I thought I would. Um, so I, I played tuba now for about, wow, 26 years. Uh, wow. And, uh, yeah. It, it, you know, as, as I went through, like by the time I was in middle school, um, I, I knew that that was what I wanted to, to do. And actually, it's funny. Uh, my, my mom is moving out of her house in a while ago. Uh, I found like a letter that I wrote uh, to myself uh, in middle school. And I talked about playing with the Chicago Symphony, going to University of Illinois, uh, and that that's that's what I wanted to do. Didn't go to University of Illinois, uh, which is which is fine. I, I, I am perfectly happy with the education I had at Iowa. Um, but yeah, yeah. So it's just something that I, I've known I wanted to do for, you know, for a very long time. Um I was always, you know, my, my, my parents were always supportive. They always carried the horn around for me because I, I wasn't going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, yeah, just been playing. Um, you know, I, I, I took a couple years off in college. I did my undergraduate at Southern Illinois University at Edwardsville and was pretty, you know, pretty consistent. You know, there are a couple years, though, where, you know, you, you hit 21 and it's like, I'm going to take a couple couple years off school and figure out, you know, what's going on with life. But uh, I ended up coming back to it, and that's whenever I really like figured out that like like teaching and performing was uh, uh, an aspect that that I really loved and and wanted to do. And you know, I started building my studio in St. Louis before I went to Iowa. And um, yeah, I still teach uh, to this day. Uh, I've got an adjunct job at Harper College, and that's also where I do my full-time job I'm, I'm the music and arts uh administrator for harper college oh, uh, and i also have a studio oh my gosh i didn't know that you were a, an administrator that's awesome yeah. yep oh that's so great yeah i actually um b before i moved here uh to washington i was a, a administrator for the performing arts center at the university of denver and I love that job. Like I love administration. I think it's such a great area, especially in the arts. So 
I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. It's I, I really I didn't know that that was something I would be interested in. But whenever whenever all the, all the, the dystonia stuff hit, um, you know, I was kind of like, you know, if, as soon as I got done with the coursework for my doctorate, I was like, well, what, what am I going to do with my life? And my my first my first music job was a salesman at, at music and arts. And I, I kind of, you know, I kind of enjoyed that, but it's, you know, the, the whole having the, the, the sales goal each month, there was a lot of pressure. And then after that, um, my, my wife actually wanted to move from St. Louis. I'm, I'm from St. Louis, go blues. Oh, Stand, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, you know, I'm a Denver fan. I, yeah. I'm an avalanche fan. So. <laughs> All right. Oh man, this is, there's just so much bad blood building up. <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, yeah, we we left we left St. Louis um, after we got married. Uh, my wife wanted to go to DePaul, so I followed her up there, and I actually got a job at a private school. Um, and I, I really like whenever I showed up, it was the British International School of Chicago, and my my job was to essentially build their their music program because whenever I showed up, they had about nine students um, in the program, and by the time that I was done, we had over two hundred and fifty private lesson students. And I had contracted out like a lot of the big names in Chicago, like uh, Hubbard Street Dance, uh, Knuckleball oh, yeah. Comedy, and really set them up to, to to be successful. And then my contract ran up, and they went another direction. Whatever. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, I know. I know how okay. it feels. I know how it um, feels. <laughs> well, thank you for for talking a little bit about that, because I mean, it's a great example of kind of how, uh, as musicians with dystonia, how we kind of deal with our how we handle our lives afterwards like mm -hmm. how do we move on how do we uh you know find work how do we transition into this this new you know deal with all the changes that happen in our life because a lot of people think well you know you get dystonia and you're set back and, and and they they don't really think about like what we go through as far as like having to change change route right away to what do i do with my life what am mm -hmm. where am i going you know um, and how how long from when you first started playing to like when you got dystonia? What would you say was like? How many years was it until you got dystonia? Um, I got dystonia in summer of two thousand thirteen. Um, so I I think I pro yeah probably had about two decades under my belt before uh, before I started noticing the, the the first symptoms. Oh wow! And then you know um. Tuba players, like, I don't know if this is true, but, you know, I, I noticed when I read the research articles and whenever it talks about tuba, play, tuba players that have embouchure de dystonia, uh, there's quite a few that have reported having, like, you know, like locked jaw or, you know, more mm -hmm. of the dystonia affecting their jaw. Um, is that the same case for you or is it different, like, the symptoms? You know, I I I've just started looking into that because I, I've, I, I just started reading that, like, uh, TMJ can be a precursor to dystonia and i know um a couple of years before i had dystonia um i had gotten a mouth uh, a mouth guard thing for 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 night because i had uh tmj so i'm really not sure um how much of an impact that had but i know uh for me it was it was in in the lips in the tongue and um i'm not really sure how much of it affected the the jaw but for sure um, my, my lips had a habit of collapsing in on each other without, uh, me doing anything. Uh, and then there were some, you know, some, some trimmers and then definitely the, uh, the, 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 the tongue would get stuck high up in, in, in my oral cavity. Oh yeah. Was, uh, so was, was the symptoms, were they gradual at first, like subtle, like for a lot of people, it, it starts off very like, you know, oh, I feel kind of like my plane is off a little and then it gradually mm -hmm. just gets worse the more we try to practice or try to adjust things and then eventually mm -hmm. we just lose our grasp on the notes it's like it just can't adjust or find a spot that seems to work um was it the same for you as well yes yeah the uh, the summer of 2013 before i left for my doctorate um my wife and i did a joint recital uh and that was really the first time that i had noticed some issues and uh, in, in the low register of my playing, I had just like what I at the time would would have described as a stutter just on like a, a, a clump of about four notes that I had trouble getting like immediacy on whenever I would try and play. Um, and then, like you said, like 
whenever I started really focusing in, uh, in inwardly trying to fix what was going on, that's when everything just started like rapidly declining. Yeah, yeah, it's really frustrating because you know, I, uh, for me, I I kind of had um, well, I kind of had this air leak happening out of out of one side, and I had never had that before. And I kind of tried to mask it a little. I was like, you know, trying to adjust my embouchure to kind of mask it. And and my professor caught on it right away. She was like, she's like, you have like an air leak or something going on there. And it was like, oh my gosh, like, and that would come and go. And then uh, eventually I, I just, I, I lost w weird things would happen where it's like I could, I could be playing like really loud, but then I couldn't cr de crescendo. I could crescendo, but not de crescendo. I could mm. like, you know, run scales going upwards, but as soon as I, I descended, it's like that last note of the passage I just couldn't grab onto. I just go flying past it. And um, it just, eventually I just felt like all these things that were easy to me for so many years, like, you know, just really simple, you know, intervals. Like if I try to play an excerpt, like a really uh, kind of easy excerpt for horn players, would be like uh, pictures at an exhibition, like this little tiny horn solo, um, which is in the middle register. It's just like, it should be really easy, you know, and um, it was just absolutely crumbling to bits. <laughs> I couldn't mm -hmm. play it at all, even Mozart, it was very difficult. And I was like, how is this possible? And I couldn't play quiet anymore. And that was like my forte was playing quietly in the mm -hmm. high register and I just couldn't, you know, do anything, but um, on tuba, what kind of like, uh, how did it affect you kind of, did you have any type of, of symptoms, like any weird occurrences like that, where you felt you could play in like, uh, not just register specific, but like, you could play like a certain dynamic, but not another, or you could tongue, but you, or you could slur, but you couldn't tongue or something like that? Yeah, the, um, you, you mentioned the, the uh, descending passages. That was uh, definitely something that I, I could not do. Like if I, if I, once I could get the note started playing anything ascending was fine. But whenever I'd start doing like uh, descending slurs or tonguing, um, you know, I could start it off, but like towards the end, I, I just, I couldn't complete it. Um, staccato notes were, were very difficult. Um, anytime I try and play a march, it was like, I, I, I'm just not even going to bother with it. I'm going to yeah. pretend like I'm playing and let my section mates, uh, cover me up um so in, in terms of I, I never really experienced anything in terms of air leaks or i know i hear a lot about like like tremors in, in notes that that never really plagued me too much um i i did have some of it but like my high register never never really went so whenever i was doing i was able to, to play my first two doctoral recitals but i was very selective over what kind of music i would play and I even went as far as commissioning a concerto and I told the guy, you know, no notes lower than an F. <laughs> that's that's it. I, I will not play anything lower than, than an F. Um, oh, wow. was, yeah, it, anything below that. It just, you know, it was a, it was a crapshoot of whether or not I'd be able to make it work or not. Yeah. So what was what is that that register that kind of range? Because I'm not I don't know tuba very well. What is that range that's most difficult for you? Would you consider that like your pedal register or your low register? Well, it, it was pretty much like, you know, what we refer to as the, the, the cash register was my register that went um, from like mid register on up was just fine. Uh, anything below mid register. And it was just there. There was nothing. There was nothing happening. You know, it was, it was very hard. Like um, I'd almost have like a, a Valsalva maneuver type type instance happen. Anytime I try and do anything, there was always a delay. Uh, in that low register, but then whenever I got to the pedal register, I, I could I could function in the pedal register. So for me, it was definitely um, register specific. Oh yeah, oh that's yeah that's uh, sorry <laughs> I got a little distracted here. Um, anyways, <laughs> sorry I have like cats and and family around. So but yes, I completely understand and relate with that a lot. Um, because I definitely feel like my my middle register is affected very heavily, um, like mm -hmm. most players. Um, when it when you uh, notice your symptoms and you started to realize that this is something really serious that I'm dealing with, you know, um, maybe I should get some help or or ask around like about this. Um, 
what was kind of your process? What did you do? Well, I actually, um, cause I had no idea what I was dealing with. Um, I, I, I had, I talked to a couple people who like were really big into like yoga and everything. And they're like, Oh yeah, you just got to focus inward and figure out what's going on. And that didn't work. And then by about my second semester, that's whenever I had the idea. It's like, okay, I have to, um, I, I'm going to take lessons with every brass faculty member uh, that Iowa had. And I, I went down the line. Um, nobody knew what I was dealing with until I got to the trumpet professor who she, she kind of, she put a name to it. And then she suggested I, I study with the, uh, the director of the school of music at the time who had some experience um, it, he he really hasn't retrained anyone, but he's kept people going through it. So I, I started studying with the tuba professor um, and the department chair of the School of Music at the time, Dave Gear, and um, he kind of he really helped me survive. Um, and it wasn't until my second year at Iowa that I actually went and saw a specialist uh, uh, that who who specialized in dystonia, and I, I, I use that term loosely. Yeah, <laughs> I know, because there's so many far in between, you know, it's very hard yeah. to find anyone that any neurologist, especially that specializes in, mm -hmm. in diagnosing dystonia. Um, yeah. I've actually been trying to collect information on all the researchers and any neurologist that that know about it, have researched it, have uh, have diagnosed it. So that way people have kind of access to this giant Excel spreadsheet I'm making. Mm -hmm. In case they're like, who do I go to? And it's like, well, you have yeah. all these people and what countries they're in and, and stuff. It's kind of a, a, a task I'm taking on, but. Um, That's wonderful. Yeah. Because yeah. the first person that I went to, I I, I studied with this person. Um, and and I, I, I would say that for an uninjured person, he is a great teacher. For somebody who has dystonia, this person doesn't even correctly define dystonia and has written several times that dystonia is a myth. Um, and I, I spent I spent probably close to two years with this particular person um, studying, you know, probably monthly or biweekly. And it, it was a very frustrating time and because the concepts that this person taught were very basic and things that I had done throughout my whole career. And it, it really made me feel horrible. Uh, because it's like he's preaching these techniques that I've been doing throughout my whole career. Do I just not understand them well enough? Um, and it turned out that that wasn't the case at all. Uh, I just happened to, to be with someone who wasn't what they said they were. Um, yeah. You, you, you and I have kind of similar uh, experiences in the sense that we both got embouchure just when I, uh, during our schooling. Mm -hmm. And then also that we, we kind of had to go through this process of, of going through people who, who you know, claim that dystonia was kind of, um, you know, something that it isn't, um, you know, like more emotional based or, mm -hmm. or whatever. And you know, I always tell people like I, I support other people helping people. I always do, um, but it, it, it's this misleading thing where it's like, you know, like uh, I was talking in the last video chat about how important it is to kind of have a cohesive approach in rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody's different. You know, maybe somebody has like um, anxiety or something uh, before they have dystonia, and they have to address that. You know, even more when they have they're rehabilitating because mm -hmm. it's something that that affects them more than any other aspect of rehabilitation. But but um, to to label dystonia as just an anxiety disorder or as just an emotional disorder is is really misleading because it, mm -hmm. it it's really you know, you have to uh, not, you have to promote it as what it is, as, as a neurological disorder, and also address the, you know, that we do have sensory loss with this disorder. It's not just, you know, uh, I forgot how to play my instrument, or I, I, you know, am having bad habits in my playing, and um, I can fix it by just, you know, um, focusing on things that, that I are, have already learned in my, in my whole entire career. You know. Yeah, or uh, uh, the 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 big one of this practitioner, uh, they they always said all you have to do is sing, and I was like, I gr I grew up I, I grew up in a in a church. I my my 
my dad sang with the, the, the Columbus and the American boys choir. So I always knew how to sing. Um, and that's, that's, you know, I, I, like a lot of my teachers had Jacob's pedagogy under their belt. So that was, that was something that I was not unfamiliar with. And whenever that person told me that's all I needed to do, it's like, wait, wait, is that, are you saying that, you know, I, I'm doing this wrong? Is there something that I'm missing? So it was, it was very, you know, like, like I said, it was, it was a very disheartening couple of years. Um, and you know, I agree. There's, you know, there's definitely some emotional aspects of it um, that, that you have to get over. Cause I know whenever my dystonia, like whenever at the same time that my dystonia uh, came on, I, I started having like these ideations and obsessive thoughts that I, I had never experienced in my life. And they both uh, kind of came on at the same time. Um, and, and, you know, so there, there were definitely some, some issues that I had to work out in, in counseling as well. But the idea that all I had to do is sing to fix my problem is very, very far from how I actually fix the problem. Yeah, it, it really is. And, um, and don't get me wrong, I, I completely understand your, you, you know, how you, you had to deal with the Jacobs myth a lot because, I mean, you're in Jacobs territory mm -hmm. <laughs> in, the, in Illinois or in, even oh, yes. in Iowa. It's just like, you know, a really huge thing. Um, and, and granted, like, you know, probably like you, like I, I, I love the concept of the Jacobs Method. And, and if I wasn't an injured musician, I would totally be like, yes, this is a great method, you know, because it gets mm -hmm. you focused on on musicality and, and singing and not so much lost in, in technique and that kind of thing, it kind of counterbalances yeah, it. But when it comes to dystonia, it's like, it i can i can understand how people some people think it might work as kind of like a, a sensory trick like kind of like getting your focus away from the symptoms but that's not how we deal with our symptoms we have to be able to address them head on and we can't just sing through them or or find this way to bypass them by by yeah singing or thinking about mm -hmm. singing or or any type of basic technique. Like we can use certain fundamentals, but it can't be used in the same way that we would, you know, like when we're studying or when we're in school, it has to mm -hmm. be used in a different approach or different way, if that makes sense. Um, yes. What would you suggest uh, worked, helped you the most? Um, well, uh, I know it's probably uh, a big uh, question, it's a broad question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, real quick, just just to, to to backtrack, like my my understanding, my understanding, like in like I said, this 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 person, I, I would send anybody who's uninjured uh, to this person uh, for lessons. But uh, the the way I understand it is, you know, you, you you hear the saying a lot: neurons that wire together fire together. And if if your movement patterns are wired with singing, then once dystonia hits, that pathway's gone. Uh, and, and if you just try and sing again, that's going to fire with the movement disorders that have been developed. Um, but to answer your question, uh, it, oddly enough, I worked at the, the University of Iowa Music Library. And uh, my boss at the time was roommates with Jan Kagarice, uh at University of North Texas. Wow. And she, yeah, like towards the end of my, my doctorate, she had told me, she's like, you really need to go down and, and see Jan. Um, and so I kind of put that in the back of my mind. And then once I decided I was finished um, with uh, with the, the current methodology that had sent me spiraling for, you know, a year and a half, two years, uh, I finally reached out to, to, to Jan and uh, she had a much different approach than this person. Um, I had a consultation with her online uh, on October of 2016. And I, I can honestly say there has not been a single day that has gone by since then where something in my playing has not improved. Um, so it, it, it was, it, it was that, that moment that, that things kind of started to make sense. Um, uh, she was, she, she functioned more as a coach. She understood whenever I told her everything that had happened over the last two years, um, she was she knew exactly why it was happening how to fix it and she just seemed to have all of the answers that i had been looking for uh the whole time oh that's awesome that's awesome i i, I know all about her too as far as like i can't even explain how many people have have been able to 
rehabilitate because of her. Mm -hmm. And that's awesome, especially as a, a as a low brass player, having someone kind of in that area as well. Um, I know with with horn players, we kind of have a little a little bit uh, troubles uh, just because of the. I don't know if this makes sense. The size of our mouthpiece it adds an additional. You know, oh, like yeah. I feel like it's much harder to retrain all the muscles that are required for those delicate movements because it's all like right up in here in this little tiny mm -hmm. area. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that's awesome. Um, can you kind of explain um, a little more like when you were uh, rehabilitating with Jan, um, like what kind of were the, 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 I don't know how to, this is very hard to describe, but kind of like the, the sensory feelings you went through, like, um, like I know when I, I re rehabilitate, like I, I had a lot of like, two steps forward, one step back, and then two steps mm -hmm. forward, one step back kind of thing, you know, like I'd have times where it's like I could play really well and I was improving a lot and then I have a little relapse and then I go back and I'd have more improvement and then I have relapse and then it was just kind of this slow back and forth like progress. Was it kind of the same for you? Um, you know, you know it, it's, it's easy for me to look back and say that everything got better. But no, the, there were like whenever we'd introduce new techniques, there there definitely was like a, a learning curve where I had to take that small step back um, and then go forward. But meanwhile, other aspects of my playing uh, would improve. Um, and, and she 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 really pointed out um, one of the first things that we did. I'm sorry, I think I think it might have been October 2015 that I had my consultation, and then I I had my in person. Uh, cause I, I, I went and went to Chautauqua, New York for a week straight in June of 2017. Um, so there, yeah, cause there, there was, there was a, quite a bit of time that lapsed between, but, uh, anyway, sorry, that's completely, uh, beside no, the point. Okay. Yeah. She, uh, like the, one of the first things that she did is she had me lay on my back, um, and blow air through a straw, um. And I, I blew air through a straw as if, if, if as if I was blowing air through my my lead pipe, um, and I just like like I, I wish I had gotten video of it because my my eyebrows my my eyelids my nose my lips my cheeks everything was just twitching uh, like crazy and and apparently those were you know a lot of dystonic ticks. Um, and it was kind of, I guess, showing her where, where maybe it was showing her where the dystonia was and everything. Um, but she really taught me a lot of like relaxation techniques right off the bat um, because I, I was, I was a very tense player. Um, one, one of the, like I, I had had a master class with a, uh, uh, a notable tuba player. And yeah, I, I really had noticed like how he, he took control of the horn and how he kind of, you know, he made it hit he, he made it his horn and he really muscled the crap out of it and um i had kind of taken that approach for a while it's like man you know he's he's getting a lot of loud playing out of it and you know that's that's what i need to do um and so that's kind of what i adopted for a while and then whenever i got to uh to jan's play she's like yeah you, you you can't do that that's just that's not how it works um so it's a lot of like full body relaxation that we did um, just, you know, a lot of time away from the horn, like practicing, it's like, okay, you know, like one of the exercises she had me do is like, I, I would sit in a chair and she would hold my, my hand up and then let go of my hand. And the, the, the idea was that, that she wanted, uh, she wanted my arm just to like completely drop. And it, it took a while for me to be able to do that. Uh, it, sorry, this one wants to make an appearance. <laughs> <laughs> so I, oh. it was only a matter of time. It's so cute. I love it. I love yeah. it. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, it, it was like the, the first, the first thing that we did was definitely learn how to relax. And then we completely redid the way that, that I breathe. Uh, it, it like the, the anatomy of my breath today is just nowhere near uh, what it is, what it was. Um, and it's yeah that that was a completely like almost like breath focus was was what led to uh she she loves my hoodie strings like anytime i wear a hoodie that's, <laughs> that's all she wants. oh my gosh i love her little paw poking up yeah 
<laughs> so, um, but yeah, okay. I, I'm sorry. I got to get back on track. Uh, does that kind of answer the question? Yeah, you're an, you're an anatomy. Of your <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, we we changed the way that I, I um, that I took a breath because the the, the way that the breathing is taught now. Um, you know, we've got like the, the, the brass, you know, breathing gym and all that kind of stuff where you're taking a, you're taking a natural, um, process and turning it into a workout. Um, and whenever you do that, you're, you're essentially taking, uh, the breath and turning it into an action. And then whenever you blow the air into the horn, that's another action. So you have, you have two actions and, and that causes issues whereas the breath should be more of a reaction to either what you've just played or what you're about to play. Um, and, and kind of figuring that out um, was, was really, you know, that, that was a, a big game changer. Cause I know like in, in golf uh, or, or tennis, like, or hockey, cause I, yeah, I'm, I, I used to play hockey a lot. Um, and whenever I do a slap shot, like, you know, it's not like a big windup. It's like, I'm, I'm focused on the target. And what my windup is, I don't know what it is. It, it just happens. And, and the, the, the release is more, the release and the target was more of what I focused on. And that's kind of what we transitioned to. Yeah, that's a lot like, um, I was just thinking, I, I'm so sorry. I was thinking of Happy Gilmore and his, his swing. But um, mm. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, you know, I, I play golf too. And it's kind of like, um, I was also thinking about how, you know, when when you get really, and it's kind of similar to music, when you really get into sports, you know, you start, you learn how to swing your, your club or your stick. And then every now and then you get stuck with some coach that will, you'll go to swing and they'll stop you like mid swing. And they'll yeah. try to like adjust your arm or tell you to like loosen your grip or like do something. And then you have to try to swing again with this new, type of style and it gets embedded in the whole process of of the swing and it's like mm -hmm. you know when did this get so you know focused on on mechanics and and this whole setup and process like you said like this kind of action based uh playing and mm -hmm. i feel very similar to you in that sense because i i before i got to estonia i was a very well, I, I was a very kind of natural player. Like I didn't really mm -hmm. think about my embouchure a whole lot. And I didn't think about um, technique really in detail as far as like fixing technique with like mechanical stuff. Um, but my professor is really heavy on that. And so I kind of got, you know, really into this process when I practiced of, of you know, doing very isolated exercises, like doing, mm -hmm you know, tonguing exercises to improve my, my articulation, um, you know, doing very range specific exercises. Um, and it, it seems like it's a normal thing, but it really got me into this trap of, of, like you said, like everything was kind of, you know, in their little, like Jan says, like in their little tasks, like it's a very task centered thing. And it's like music is mm -hmm. not a skill level it's not a certain skills broken up into little skills it's it's a process music is a process mm -hmm. of, of playing and it's kind of like what you're saying with the air as well yeah absolutely it's it's a very it's a very forward process that, that we do like everything is focused on um outward movement forward movement and it's funny because um now, now that now that i think about it because i've i've gotten really uh my, my latest endeavors, uh, I, I've, I've started doing um, Muay Thai, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and wrestling. And wow. like, part of the reason part of the reason that I like it is like, we, we don't we don't talk anything about like the buildup. And like, in fact, like if you talk about the buildup, or, or anything, or like, if you telegraph a swing or anything, that's complete, it's all forward motion on all of those. Like there's, there's no, there's no real wind up or anything you don't cock back it's all forward motion that that we that we do and that's part of the reason that i that, that i kind of love it and i love love the analogies that i i, I draw but but between it um because you know like i said it, it is it's all it's on action focused on, on the right action um like like with tuba playing it's you know the 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 air going forward is what's doing the work not the you know not the inhaling not the let's 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 take a breath and then sniff in six times and then, then let it go. That's, you know, there, there's nothing, nothing like that. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I definitely had, you know, when I, when my symptoms were, I don't know what your severity of your symptoms were when you, when 
it kind of reached your height. Um, but for me, I like I got to the point where I couldn't even like get a sound out of my my horn. Mm -hmm. I would go to blow, and it would just I couldn't even keep it on my face. So I kind of had to go through this whole process of just completely shutting down that signal of. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm playing the horn because it's like even if I go like this to my hands my brain is like oh my gosh I'm playing the horn um and I automatically would set like you know just naturally my brain would be like set my embouchure and I go and play mm -hmm. and normally that would work you know you just go and you set up and it plays and you don't have to think about it but in this case it was damaged so it's like I had to completely um learn how to blow loose air through very relaxed uh, embouchure, just focusing mm -hmm. on letting this like be loose and react to the airstream rather than the airstream react to my setup, if that makes sense. Yeah. And that, yeah, that, absolutely. that helped me be able to, to, to play again and get a, get a sound out and be able to regain a lot of my abilities. But it was, mm -hmm. it was very, you know, like a lot of people want a, a cure or answer, but it's it's very little, little minuscule work. It's very boring mm -hmm. work, but it's very it, it just takes a long time of, of working on on that. It takes a lot of mental focus. Oh, absolutely. It, it's nowhere like like my practice sessions before. It's like you know, I, I put on a TV series in the background and and go to town for a couple hours, and now it's like you know if, if I can get like twenty to thirty minutes strung together. It's like, yeah, I can't have anything in the background because I, I have to focus so much on uh, what, what's, what's going on and be very aware of, you know, my, my body. You know, if I start like finding myself slipping into the old habits, you know, I just, I have to stop and get away from it. Um, for me, like in my, my peak of it, um, I, I like whenever I was playing with the University of Iowa Symphony Band, uh, I, I had to play the tuning notes for, um, for, for the band and every day, like I would just dread it because, you know, here I am, I'm, I'm a doctorate on, you know, doctoral student on fellowship and I would try and play a, just a middle B flat and I, I couldn't do it. The band director would stop me and be like, no, you got to do it again. And it was, it was humiliating. Uh, it, it was, it was awful. I actually had to go to the band director mid semester and be like, I can't do this anymore. I don't know what's going on um, with my face, but I, I, I can't play anymore. Um, and he was fortunately, fortunately, he was very understanding and let me write a paper instead of continuing the semester. But it was, it, it was very tough to, to deal with that. Yeah, I know how, how humil humiliating it is because, um, I kind of went through the same thing too in school, you know, um, I actually was working on a recording and it was with a tuba player that was at UNI. And um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you know him, his name is Aaron Hines, but he- Oh yeah, yeah, I yeah, did Yeah, he used to have a band called the Midwest Hackers and um, mm -hmm. they they were recording some tracks and they needed some, some horn playing in it. And so I agreed to do it. But mm -hmm. it was this very like held out notes, like just held out notes. And I remember like, I really wanted to do the recording, but it was it was so, difficult because I would have this subtle tremor in my plane and I just mm. could not get it to go away. I was like, and, and he'd record it over again and he'd be like, let's just re try recording it again. And I'd be like, oh my gosh, like, you know, I'm so sorry. <laughs> this is so yeah awful. And then my real humil humiliation was, you know, I one of the last symphonies I played was Brahms second symphony and it has this huge solo for the principal horn and, 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 you know, I just, um, it just crashed and burned like mm -hmm. during rehearsals and the concert. And I, I, I was trying to explain to everyone, you know, all my teachers and what was going on. And, and like you, they just didn't, they didn't understand. They completely yeah. did not understand. And it was just frustrating. But um, I'm glad that you had, uh, you know, at least they're able to understand and be like, hey, you can write a paper to finish mm -hmm. out your semester. You don't have to force yourself you know, because I feel like a lot of people, they'll they'll be stuck in this situation where they're forced to keep playing and they end up with a secondary injury, like a muscle tear or. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like that. And it's just. Yeah. You know. And if I'm not mistaken, there there's there's a there's a guy on the UNI campus who is a sufferer as well. Correct. I don't know. Do you know someone like that? I, I don't know. I, I I do. We'll we'll talk we'll talk later, so I'm not throwing out names. 
Okay, okay. I just want to, I was like, no, I, maybe I, I probably don't, because if, if they weren't there when I was there, then I probably didn't know them, but, because, um, yeah, I was there between 2006 and 2010, so I might have, might have missed them. I'm kind of old now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think, I think this person would have, would have been there at that, at that time. Huh. Okay, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll definitely talk and see. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, yeah, you know, you were, you were talking a little bit about how, um, uh, I, I'm sorry, I wrote the question down that I'm now I'm looking for it. I was gonna, oh, I was gonna ask you, um, like, what kind of kind of advice do you have for, uh, let's say, if, if you you met a tuba player that that was recently diagnosed with Amish um, dystonia? Um, would you have any specific advice for for tuba players in general? I mean, I know it's it's almost sure it's always kind of the same between all of us, but but I know that in each instrument it kind of affects us differently. Like, is there any type of advice you would give? You know, I I've been I've been approached by by more people than I would have liked to have been approached by, and that's not because I don't want to be approached. I I, I want to do my part to help, but it's it, it's kind of disheartening to see the the amount of the the growing community. Uh, it's you know it's it, it's something that I. You know, I, I actually had a teacher um, who was was just awful <laughs> uh, during during he he was not the professor at, at SIU. He was a guy I took lessons from on the side, and he was not a good teacher or person. And he his career was ended by dystonia, and even seeing that was very upsetting to me. So it's something that I wish upon no one. But whenever people do come to me. The, the biggest advice that I that I have for them is to, to stress that, you know, if, if you if you want to get through this, it, it's definitely something you can get through. Um, it's not going to be easy. Um, and, I, and I always try to give them a list of, of practitioners. Um, and I always stress that it's, it's not the same for everybody um, and not to listen to advice from just like a single source and to, to kind of explore on their own. Um, but the biggest thing is just to be aware, like do your own research, figure out, figure out what the disease is, make sure that the person that you're going to can correctly define the, the, the condition. I said disease, sorry, condition. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, sometimes it sure does feel like it. Um, so yeah, make sure that the person that you're going to uh, can correctly de define it because I, I, I would not want to see somebody make the same mistake I did and end up with someone who uh, doesn't even believe it exists. Um, but in, in general, um, I, I know enough. I, I, I know enough that I can get people started um, to a certain extent. But my, my number one advice, like I... I Anyone with Amateur Dystonia, I, I really try and encourage them to, to get a hold of Jan Kegerice. Um, I, I wish had that been my first step. I, I don't know, you know, I, I don't know that I would have it, it would have been this long uh, or difficult of a of a process. And also now, I, I know she's expensive, but you know, it's it's she also has some interns now that are much cheaper uh, and give incredible uh, lessons. And I've actually. Um, I, I still see Jan probably, you know, three or four times a year, uh, but once or twice a month, I take a lesson with her, with, with some of her interns and th they're, they're wonderful. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's my best advice is to, um, uh, ma like, don't go to, don't go to your private lesson teacher if they don't ha don't have experience with it. Cause I know a lot of people, they just want to go, you know, go to who's familiar. And a lot of times uh, the familiar person just, they, they're going to lead you down a, a wrong path. Cause I know whenever I did that, I, I got a lot of bad information. I, I was asking for information from people who just, they didn't have it. Uh, and that's, that's dangerous. Yeah, it really is. I mean, it, and it is hard because, you know, some, some people have really good intentions. You're like, mm -hmm. you're like, well, I, I really look up to you and you, you are, are professional. They could be a professional. And you'd be mm -hmm. like, I, I have a lot of respect for you. I look up to you but this is something that you know you have no experience with and this is mm -hmm. something that is just not it's not you know bad habits it's not something that i think corrected with you know technique it's not something that can be fixed mechanically right away it's mm -hmm. not um you know this uh, a simple solution and it's very hard to navigate it you know if you don't have it to understand yeah. like what 
you're dealing with, especially when you have like certain things change, you know, because it's very hard to describe uh, physiology, you know, because it's like we can be like, oh, yeah, you have to have perfect corners and a flat chin or whatever. Mm -hmm. But it's very hard to describe like what's going on with your face on the on the inside or what you're dealing with when you have like a relapse or, or yeah. you're having a struggles with a certain, you know, pattern or something like that or register um, to, to walk someone through that. It's very difficult. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's really important to talk about the, the embouchure, you know, retraining because we, we have like nothing in comparison to hand dystonia. We don't have, mm -hmm. you know, splints or, you know, the mirror, mirror therapy or, um, any type of physiologist that can work with us on this so yeah i see a lot of those guitar players in some of the facebook groups talking and like half the time like i get through half through halfway through their post and it's like you, you've completely lost me because <laughs> <laughs> it's it, it's a completely different animal uh so it's it's yeah it, it's a much different scenario for them and it's you know it's hard, hard to grasp onto those concepts of the the, the actual physical um you know hand uh hand issues that they they struggle with yeah yeah and 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 embouchure stone is very difficult to describe because you know we don't we don't have these separate limbs you know fingers mm -hmm. or or wrist joint we are dealing with so so much like the tongue and the air and the the jaw and the mm -hmm. chin and for some people have it very severe it even goes as far back as the neck and the shoulders or or back um mm -hmm. I surprisingly run into a lot of, of high brass players that have uh, cervical dystonia or they have um, a, a dystonia where it's, it's very specific, like it, it hits their jaw more than their upper face. And for some it's more yeah. up here and less back here. Um, so it's just very, you know, individualistic. So it's, it, it's very hard to describe to people who don't, who don't understand it, but yeah, but like you, you know, you come across people who are, are just, give bad advice where it's like they're like it's not real you're just have bad habits or or they think it's all about the tension it's like yeah we mm -hmm. we address tension a lot in rehabilitation but it, it's not it's not like a normal tension it's not like a tension mm -hmm. that you created by bad playing it, it, it's something that's set that because of the dystonia it's like you're having these one muscle fighting another and you're dealing yeah. with these co-contractions and they're involuntary, they're out of our control. It's not something that we're practicing. It just, it just happens, you know? Mm -hmm. And yeah. And I, I know a person, um, I know a person who, who took a singular lesson with the original person that I went to. And for a while there, this person would advertise themselves as a dystonia expert themselves. And that that really like that that severed our our relationship uh, quite a bit because I, I I kept on warning this person how dangerous and irresponsible what they were doing was. Um, so that that yeah, it, it's oh you my know, god, it's very hard. And for for uninjured musicians too, um, you know, I'm not I'm not sure how many people will listen to this that, that haven't experienced it. Um, you touched on it a little bit. Um, like some people like, like get starstruck. And I think one of the, one of the dangerous things that, that we experience in brass playing is, um, whenever, whenever you have these one-off lessons or master classes with somebody that you really respect. Um, and, and I think, I think there are people, I think there are people who are out there who could go their whole career doing everything wrong. Um, that you know, doing everything that that would lead to dystonia in, in someone like like me, and not get it, and then they go and present what they're doing to young impressionable kids, and then they pick it up because hey, this person plays for XYZ Orchestra, and then all of a sudden because they were starstruck, you know, in a couple months or a year, they have to make a phone call to someone and say, oh, you know, crap, I've got dystonia. Um, so I, I think it's. Yeah, you know, I, I think I think younger students and, and teachers need to be more aware of who they're inviting onto campus and what advice is being given to their kids, um, and and make sure that they aren't falling into that trap. Um, I, I've I've I, I know a couple of cases where where people have taken a single lesson with a single person and the advice that they got from that person directly led to to them calling Jan. 
Yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, it's, it's difficult because, you know, in the, in the brass world, well, especially uh, I guess classical world, we, we are so far behind on, on, uh, performance pedagogy. Like mm -hmm. we don't really have a standard for it. And we also don't have, you know, kind of everybody just kind of go in their own direction, specializing mm -hmm. in their own area, you know, there are billions of dissertations written on, you know, how to articulate, how to place your yeah. top in the right place, you know, things like that, where we don't really know what, there is no really right or wrong way, but, you know, we can have a general guideline, but to enforce that in a way that's where it could be unhealthy to someone who, where their physical anatomy might not be, you know, it might not be built to, to you know, do that specific style of tonguing. It might, might not yep. be able to do that specific type of motion with their jaw where they, you might be like, you need to drop your jaw in the low register. What if there's something that they just can't do it and it's not getting in the way of the plane. So why, why make all these changes or force all these mm -hmm. changes that might inhibit their plane and, and later down the road cause dystonia or something like that, mm -hmm. where it's just not a natural way of playing. And I, I really do feel like like I had, I, I somehow developed dystonia because it, I was doing uh, a natural thing. It's not like mm -hmm. on purpose, but I had been kind of trained in this direction where it's like, wow, I'm doing very things that are very rudimental and very specific mm -hmm. repetitively over time. And although my plane is the greatest it's ever been, there's just an aspect of it that didn't feel natural anymore. And, mm -hmm. and then I found myself with dystonia, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I definitely think for me, the I, I got really heavy into the over breathing because I had heard a tuba player, like I said, that 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 particular tuba player, he 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 owns the horn, very aggressive style and massive breaths. And I was like, that's that's what I got to do. And like and I, I it's hard. It's so hard to pinpoint what, what exactly caused it. But. I definitely think that that was at least a contributing factor. And, um, and what you said about like, like, you know, a, a player anatomy um, up here in Chicago, my goodness, like, I, I can't tell you how many students I've had come through my door. Um, and like, you know, I'll have, I'll have trumpet students who have only been playing They're in high school and they've only been playing a couple of years. And they're like, Oh, I have a three C mouthpiece. And it's like, why? Cause my band director makes all of us play on three C mouthpieces. <laughs> it's like, it, it just it just doesn't make any sense to me. It's like you know you can go down a line of ten trumpet players and have each of their 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 you know their their bone structures be completely different, and you know that what works for one won't work for another, and it's you know it's very frustrating to fight. And then you know I I know this might might offend some people, but I, I feel like in the brass world we're very stuck on the the Jacobs methodology that was you know his his newest research is at least what like four decades old and we're still you know I, I see people all the time oh we don't need to do the research because jacobs already did it like with mouthpiece buzzing he didn't do any research on mouthpiece buzzing there's no research that exists on it it worked for him but there's there's no scientific research that he did so that's my that's my hot button topic that that <laughs> might, <laughs> might rub people the wrong way but no, you're and you're absolutely right. And horn players are kind of the same way, you know. And, and they all come from the Chicago Symphony. And you know, we have Farkas, and yep. and and everybody follows, the, you know, Farkas book like a Bible. And he talks a lot about this whole setup with the embouchure. And so, you know, I had I had teachers that were very strict about the way embouchure should look, the the way you should breathe. And it was all based on his book. Everything that I've ever learned was based off of that book. Um, it's very rarely derived away from that. And um, granted, you know, it, it's, you know, it's, it's fun to explore physiology and try to explain, you know, what we do here. Um, it, I think we're coming to a point now where we're seeing more cases of, of injured musicians and more cases mm -hmm. of local dystonia that it's time to rethink like how we look at physiology and how we study mm -hmm. it because it's, it's, it's not good to get into the trap of assuming we know what is right or wrong or correct or, or what is efficient because movement is it's a whole nother ball game. You know, if you study sports uh, medicine or uh, uh, sports uh, psychology, they do all these studies on on movement and efficiency and 
where musicians, we don't, we can't really do that because a lot of, a lot of the time we don't have the, the, the researchers that do that, but, mm -hmm. um, but you're right. It is, you know, we're kind of leaning on these decade old, old information. And mm -hmm. that's why I really like, um, I don't know if you know, David Wilktone, I really love his, uh, website because he he does a lot of just a new approach of, of kind of viewing embouchures and 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 movement and um i read something that david binding once said too that really struck that that kind of stuck with me and he said that you know um we spend our whole we spend our whole lives looking at pictures of embouchures and saying that's a perfect embouchure and this is how i should look when i play um but in reality embouchures move you know it's not this plain black and white photo we have movement yeah. we have tongue yeah, it's a it's a three-dimensional thing and it's it, it doesn't exist without air so why are we looking at books of two-dimensional embouchures yeah exactly so i agree with you and i feel like uh having dystonia has it's probably the same with you has made made me look a lot better teacher but also mm -hmm. look at things from a different perspective and really question the way you know we're we're being taught and also the way we're we're you know also being educated on health and and safety as well because you know people are all about like don't use pressure and you know mm -hmm. uh and that kind of thing but it's like you know dystonia isn't in our case dystonia isn't isn't like a physical overuse injury necessarily it's not like a, something that we're maybe a physical overuse of, of the motor skills but mm -hmm. not necessarily, you know, it's not like we're, we're cramming it in our face and, and, you know, I mean, for some people probably, yeah, but I definitely felt like I, I wasn't doing anything physically wrong to, mm -hmm. I wasn't physically overusing myself uh, to, to get to this point. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's just, it's an interesting topic. <laughs> definitely, definitely. And, um, you know, it, it's I, I know University of North Texas, they, they to my knowledge, they're offering the first doctoral uh, program in musicians health. So I don't know what all it entails, but I'm, I'm hoping it does something um, that in relation to like the physiology of brass playing um, and, and the, the physiology of, of, you know, just how the, the circulatory system works, how the lungs work and, and, and how you breathe, because I, I, you know, I've I, I can't tell you how many students come in and they're just like taking these awful, awful breaths. And it's like, you know, you've been doing this since you were a baby. It should not be, uh, it shouldn't be a workout. And, um, uh, you know, I, 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 we, we talked beforehand, I, I did some, some, some research that I was supposed to present at a tuba conference. And, um, uh, I, I interviewed, I think I had like probably, it, it was dozens, at least dozens of people respond. I sent out the, I sent it out to uh, members of the new world symphony, the Chicago symphony or the Chicago civic orchestra, uh, the orchestra now professors, people that I knew had dystonia. Um, I, I got a ton of responses and 98% of the responses, 98% of people who responded had some sort of overuse injury, some sort of dystonia, some sort of mo motor skill breakdown, uh, physical, mental, emotional trauma as a direct result of their playing so even though some of that isn't dystonia related it, it was it, it was what i was expecting but actually seeing the data there in person it was just it, it was it was just staggering the amount of uh, pressure and, and and incorrect information that's out there that's causing us to to experience these these setbacks and, and everything it, it was it was very eye-opening to to see it put put in paper and, and you know tangible data yeah, and you're you're right. It's it's so funny because there's so many unreported cases of of injuries mm -hmm. and uh, dystonia as well. Um, uh, and I think I read somewhere that there was I think it's six percent of musicians in the U.S. that are hired and working are disabled that have mm -hmm. reported themselves disabled. And it's like a. a a large number but i'm guessing there's probably more than that as well you know i definitely feel like we all go through some type of setback or mm -hmm. physical setback at some point um whether it's like you know need chiropractic work or yeah. you know jaw jaw reading or dental stuff um you know um having to deal with dentures as you get older and just little things like that um mm -hmm. and it's it needs to be spoken out about a lot more than we do you know we've never been educated on this type of thing we've just been taught 
if you have the right technique, you have the right setup, you're invincible. You will never get injured. You'll never yep. have some type of setback. You will be, you know, uh, the Philip Smith of, of, of the classical world, which coincidentally Philip Smith now has an armor ship in Estonia. But <laughs> yeah, exactly. And a lot of the people who are saying that have never had any kind of setback in their life. There, there is some of the, you know, there, you know, you've got the, the, the lucky minority there who have gone through their whole career with nothing major happening. And, um, you know, I, I, I absolutely, I, I, I adore my teacher that I had at, um, at Iowa and, and he's one of the few people that, that I, I would still study with and, and trust to teach me. But, you know, I, I look at, you know, his, his path and it's, it, it was pretty straightforward with not a lot of setbacks. Um, to my knowledge, I, I will, I will throw that out there. Cause you know, I, I, he didn't really talk about anything uh, that, that he had happened to him, but to my knowledge, he hasn't really had anything. And it's, you know, we're, we're, we're training a bunch of, you know, a, a bunch of machines to, to just sit in a practice room five, six hours a day. And whenever you're not in the practice room, do score study. And it's, it's, it's really an unhealthy thing that, that we're um, embedding into a lot of young musicians brains. And it's, you know, it, unfortunately it's going to keep people like, like, like Jan and the next generation of uh, uh, dystonia practitioners in business. Yeah, exactly. And I, I really agree. You know, it's, it's hard for, uh, musicians who who haven't had any setbacks to understand what we're going through because mm -hmm. and I can kind of relate just a little bit just because you know like I said I, I have always been kind of a natural player I've never really uh, had to work very hard at at you know yes. developing my skill level it's always been like if somebody wanted me to change my armature bam it happened in five months or you know mm -hmm. they want me to work our articulation my articulation has improved in like three weeks or you know it's never been a struggle but I feel like for some musicians, they, you know, were, were taught from a very young age, like music is easy. It's not something that hurts you. It's something mm -hmm. that is very simple. It's easy to learn, you know, as you go along. And as you get better and better, you improve your skills and um, you're less likely to get hurt. Um, and I remember when I when I first started, when I got that to the height of my symptoms, I started to feel like, I started to think like, wow, um, I don't know how to describe, you know, going from this place of like music is so easy to play mm -hmm. to how is this so difficult? How is this so out of my grasp and, and so out of my control? Um, no one would ever believe me that it's like night and day. It's like you've been yeah. playing so naturally for years and years and years. And then all of a sudden it's like, it's almost like, uh, uh, like you just forget everything, like your body. Exactly. Forgets all the sensations. Yeah. yeah Cause I, I, I was just like you, like, you know, I, I, I started taking private lessons pretty, pretty early, but like, it was pretty much here, here, here's some music, play it. And then I'd come back next week. That's fantastic. You know? So I, I, I never, you know, I never really had to work to, to, to develop my amateur at all. I pretty much just did, did what I wanted and, and you know, the improvement just came there. And it's like, you know, I always compare it to, it's like, you know, imagine waking up one day and like, putting on your shoes and going to tie your shoes and it's like you just can't you you could tell somebody exactly how to tie your shoe but like you just can't do it like it's you know your, your hand spasm or you know it's you know and that's 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 how i've tried to explain it. and i still you know i still have people um one of the one of the last gigs before i, I quit quit playing um i i played a, a an opera a wagner opera which was very stupid <laughs> under the circumstances um, and the guy next to me who, he was another guy who has never had an issue. He, um, he, he, he thought I was making the whole thing up. Um, and it took him four years. It took him four years before he finally called me one day and he's like, I'm really sorry. He's like, I, I looked into it and this is a very real thing. And I, I, I'm, I remember being very, very blunt with you and, and short-sighted. So you know, it, it took him a while to finally realize that hey, this is this is real and this is something that he actually went went through. So, yeah, it's oh my gosh, yeah, I could if I had a dime for every time somebody has someone has been like, you know, oh, I think I think you're you're suffering with the pain. I think maybe it's a confidence issue, or maybe mm -hmm. you just haven't learned how to play out louder, or maybe you haven't 
you know, worked with so and so. It's like, no, that's not it at all. It's it's not that at all. Um, yeah, my body's just betraying me. That's yeah, it's <laughs> it's like, and I tell people all the time, you know, it, it really is is for me is very much like a sensory disorder. Like it's like. Mm -hmm no matter where I place my mouthpiece, I just can't find the spot. I just can't grab onto the notes. I just can't seem to mm -hmm. adjust. Like normally you, if you're playing a passage and you miss a note, you can make a slight adjustment the next time you put it on your face you, and your body tells you where to adjust. It'll be like, mm -hmm. oh, just a slight tilt here or a little more lower lip, but you don't think about it. Your body just naturally does it. And mm -hmm. the note comes out, you know, right the second time you do it. And the more you practice, the more it comes out accurately. And dystonia is the opposite. It's like you'll put it on your face and you'll go to play and you miss. And then you go to adjust. And it's like there's no sense of feeling of adjustment. Your body doesn't do it. So you manually have to try to figure it out. And then when you mm -hmm. manually try to figure it out, it just gets worse and worse. It's like the yeah. muscles start to fight you more and more and more. They start to contract and get tense and and clamp down and then all of a sudden you're you're dealing with like no sound coming out and it's it's a lot like looking in the mirror and just seeing things melt um like mm -hmm. i i i remember when i first started having symptoms i would play through a passage and look in the mirror and everything looked completely normal and natural and everything was playing naturally and then five i'd go to play the same passage a second time and all of a sudden i saw like my corners collapsing or my you know like one side of my cheek starting to kind of droop and it was just so bizarre it was like i felt like i i was watching my muscles just give out in slow motion mm -hmm. it was very like what the heck what the heck is going on here i just don't know <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah um well i'm so glad that you shared so much with us i'm gonna do a quick shout out even though it's late um i want to give a shout out to aaron hines because it looks like he joined us on the chat and he says oh, yeah. He says, two different people I know from two different places. Um, Aaron, if you're still watching, we were talking about you a little earlier. <laughs> and um, there's uh, one of my family members. And then there's Dan Malloy Jr. He's actually the principal horn of the Cedar Falls uh, Symphony in Iowa. And mm -hmm. so I just want to say hello to him as well, because um, he's very close to the UNI horn, horn people. <laughs> um, before we go, um, you were talking about how you were doing, uh, going to give a presentation, um, and uh, but your event got canceled, and I'm so sorry about that. I, it's very disheartening because I, I I'm also giving a presentation at IHS uh, in August, and it hasn't been canceled yet. But I'm still kind of like, oh no, I just know it's going to happen if this virus goes on any longer. But um, was there anything else you want to touch upon as far as uh, the presentation you were going to give? Uh, just, just really a couple things like like the 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 the, the big thing was the, the shocking amount of uh, of of people that have been affected by some sort of movement disorder, um, and the the things the things that I've gotten out of it is is make sure like like we can't be one dimensional people. Um, like I I feel like I'm at a point finally where I'm playing better than I've ever been playing. Um, I, I'm I'm planning on taking a few auditions next year. Um, I'm I'm playing gigs again. I'm teaching again. Um, and and one of the things that has really helped me is is diversifying myself as as a human being. Um, and realizing that like like music, you know, because everyone always says their lives are music, and it's like for me, uh, you know, if 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 my life is like a pie, pizza, you know, like like tuba playing is just one piece of that pie if you take away tuba playing there's there should still be some good pie left over so that's that's like the 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 big thing that i i took out of my presentation is just make sure that you 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 have other things going on in your life because heaven forbid if something like that happens uh you know for me at the time like i had i had tuba and i had my fiance at the time and tuba got out of there and like i was i was lost i was like you know who in the heck am i and then I put all that pressure on my wife to be everything, which it, it, it wasn't a healthy situation. And, you know, I feel like just now you know, I'm, I'm finding a new normal in my life. Um, you know, I, I have that healthy relationship with tuba. I have things that I'm interested in. I'm, 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 I'm doing martial arts. I'm, I'm finding friends outside of music and activities outside of music. Um, and I, I think that's a, a big thing that we need to, we need to start encouraging healthy musicians and those who 
who are injured is, is just to, to have fun outside of music, find other things that you enjoy doing and try not to be, try not to be one dimensional. And then also diversify within music because the, the market is getting so oversaturated that even, even had I not gotten to Estonia, you never know what would have been. Ha- I might, I might be here had I not gotten to Estonia because it's, it's a, it's a very saturated market. And I know, you know, I, I know, I know Aaron, uh, a shout out, another shout out to Aaron. He's a, he's a great example of that as somebody who is making a, a great living in music as uh, somebody who isn't, you know, a, a, a studio teacher or a professional musician. And, you know, I like his career is awesome. Like it, it is so awesome that he's able to do the things that he does uh, in the music technology world. Like I, I wish, I wish I knew how to, to, to do recordings and, and sound editing and everything. But, you know, I left my doctorate. I didn't know how to record myself. I didn't know how to build a website. I didn't know how to use any kind of sound editing material. And, you know, I, I really think it's important to, to, to learn how to do, do those things so you're not limited to, you know, a, a college studio or an or- orchestra job or bust. So, and, and that's, you know, th- those, are the, those are the major things that I, I got out of my uh, presentation. There's, there's a lot more that I, that I could go into depth, but I am planning on presenting once all, all of this madness ends. Yeah, oh, definitely. And if you ever, you know, we should have you, you do this again. And um, if you want to talk more about it, I'd love to because um, it's just so great being able to talk to someone that, that has the same disorder and, and share with the public like what we kind of go through and especially seeing your point of view, it's always great seeing other people's point of views too. Um, and it also where we kind of cross sections in, in our experiences as well. Um, and I'm just really grateful that you shared so much with us. Um, before we go, is there anything else that you wanted to touch upon before we leave? Um, I got nothing. <laughs> I, I really appreciate <laughs> you having me on. Uh, it, it's been great to, to, to share in, in and be able to you know talk, talk with someone else who's gone through this. And I just want to, I just want to share really quickly to anyone who's watching the end of the video. Um, you're you're able to play again. Uh, you're be able to play in ensembles, right? And you're working on mm-hmm. on auditions. So um, to be able to have Dystonia get back to that point is for a lot of people is really possible impossible. <laughs> um, if anybody has read research on Dystonia, it's very hard. It's very low percentages of, of us musicians, especially with embouchure Dystonia, to return to performance of, of any <laughs> variety. So even just getting to the point of being able to play like in a local group like I do is, is difficult. Um, so I'm just really glad to see someone on here that that can give so many people hope and um, inspire them and let them know that you know it is possible to get back mm-hmm. to that place um and just really quickly um i don't know if this is the same for you i kind of want to ask you and i forgot to ask this earlier um for me now that i've i've be able i'm able to play again in a group um i feel like my new way of playing is much better than the old way i don't know if that makes sense um i feel like a lot better player but because you know i'm i'm a lot more um efficient and more more relaxed and everything um but it's it's not the same pathway that i used before like not the same brain signal or pathway that i used before Mm -hmm. and i think that a lot of people kind of get confused with with the word recovery because um there's a difference between cure and recovery so it's like we can rehabilitate to the point where we recover close to almost all our abilities or all of our abilities and be able to play again it, just because it's not the same pathway that we had before doesn't mean that um, that it's less uh, official. I don't know if that makes sense. Because mm-hmm. um, it's like it's kind of like with writers destroying it too. It's like you can relearn how to write the letters in a different way and restore your ability to write. It may be different than the original way you're used to writing, but as long as you're able to do it again and it feels safe and it feels good, um, you know, kudos to you. I don't. I would never judge someone for that. Um, so I don't know. Do Do you feel like um, it's the old pathway that you've restored, or do you feel like it's kind of a little bit different? Oh, it's completely different. Uh, everything about how I play is completely different. Um, and it, and it's allowed it's allowed me to to to. Um, I, I, I see a pathway to a higher level level of playing than I was ever able to achieve going the old way. Um, I feel like the old way, um, 
I didn't see it at the time, but I feel like the old way definitely had a ceiling um, that I wouldn't have been, been able to, 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 to break through. And the, the new way of playing, it's like, now it's like all those ridiculously hard pieces that I hear people play. It's like, okay, I see how I can do that eventually. That's awesome. And, and even I, I, I was finally after um, nearly five years, I was finally able to play my, my final doctoral recital uh, back in April. And I didn't have to pull any punches on the pieces that I programmed. I felt like, uh, I felt like my, my choices were definitely a lot different than they would have been, but I felt like the difficulty of, of pieces that I put on my, my recital was, you know, I, you know, it, I didn't have to make any exceptions. I didn't have to special pick or hand pick any pieces. It was, it was just music that I wanted to play. Oh, that's awesome. That's really great to hear. That's so, oh, that's so inspiring. I haven't quite got to that level yet, but I'm, I, I know I can do with some more work. I finally have some time to focus on rehabil rehabilitation some more. Sorry about my family. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> There's some sniffles around here. Um, yeah, it's so great talking to you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, close out here. So I just want to say bye to everyone and, um, and thank you for talking with me. If you ever want to do this again, just let me know. I'd love to. And, I'd love um, to, yeah share your video wherever you want um so it will be published on my my uh, uh -huh. timeline here in a couple minutes and you should be able to see that show up okay all right adam is great having you i hope you have a great uh -huh. day and that you're staying safe yes you too all right i'm gonna post this picture and then i'm gonna go ahead and log off <laughs>